Haney, how much blood pressure is enough? I got a great case to talk to you about, and this is going to really bring out the talks about blood pressure and how we need to manage it. This guy, 72 years old, this is a real case. He was riding bikes with his wife. She actually was ahead of him, and he went down. So she turned around, she heard him go down, and she doesn't know why he went down, but she went back saw that he was unresponsive for at least two minutes. He was wearing a helmet and he doesn't have any significant history. He's not on any blood thinners. He's actually not on any significant medications. So she calls EMS. EMS shows up. They bring him into the hospital. They said he had a headache. He was wearing a helmet. It's got a slight crack in it, but he keeps asking the same questions the whole way to the hospital. The nurse in the room said that he was perseverating, asking the same questions. And the resident went in to see the patient and evaluated the patient, did a fast exam. It was negative, put in some labs, put in some CT exams and moved on to the next. I had no idea this patient was in the department. And the nurse grabs me about a half an hour later and says, please come in. I need some help. And I walk in and the patient's got a He's sitting up in bed saying, I want to leave. I want to leave. And his wife is trying to keep him in the bed. And he keeps asking the same questions. He doesn't remember what happened. We do a quick trauma exam. He's got an abrasion to the right forehead. He's got tenderness to his left chest. And he's his neuro exam is not great. He knows who he is. He doesn't know where he was. He's un, unreliable as to the events. But he's moving all extremities and otherwise looking pretty good. But this is his blood pressure. Now, at this point, we know he fell from a bike, but we don't know why he fell from the bike. Did he fall and have a traumatic brain injury or did something else happen? We don't know anything. We got to get a CAT scan, don't we? Yeah, we do. So we do get a CAT scan. We get him off. He's redirectable enough to get a CAT scan. And this is what we see. We've got a a left temporal bleed there that looks parenchymal. We've got what looks like a subdural on the right frontal. And then in the tentorium, what is that? Is that a subarachnoid? Is that another subdural? Or is that some kind of a parenchymal bleed? I really don't know when I'm first looking at it. And in the meantime, he's on his way back from CAT scan and radiology calls me. And she says, you got to send him back. I'm worried there might be some blood in the abdomen. I said, oh, he's not even back yet, but we'll think about it. But by the time he gets back, he looks horrible. Now he's agitated. He's climbing out of the bed. And I said, we really need to intubate him. He's not going back to CAT scan. And then I turn around and there's the chief neurosurgery resident who says, I want to take this patient to the OR. And I say, you need to talk to radiology because they think there may be blood in the belly and I'm going to intubate this guy, whatever we do, because now he's agitated. And so we're thinking about that. He goes off to the radiology suite. In the meantime, what do we do with this blood pressure? That's the big question. And it really relies on what we think is going on. So first off, if we think this is a traumatic brain injury, he's 72 years old he should have a blood pressure that's greater than 110 by the guidelines. But if we think that he's got a spontaneous bleed that caused him to fall, and then he had additional traumatic brain bleed, then it's a different story, isn't it? Let's go through these two to see what we do with these blood pressures. So if it's a traumatic brain injury, the guideline now says that the blood pressure should be greater than 100 if you're age is between 50 and 69. He's 72, so he gets 110 as a goal. We don't want it to drop below that. There's many different types of traumatic bleeds, and the guidelines apply to all of them. And back in the early 90s, Randy Chesnut showed us that one drop of systolic blood pressure less than 90 is associated with such a big increase in mortality. And today we have even better studies out from Arizona with Dan Spate, who's showing us that if the blood pressure is higher, even as high as 135 systolic, outcomes are better. So we know intuitively that more blood pressure is better. And here we go back to the concept of cerebral perfusion pressure. It's all about the CPP. And as the ICP goes up, 
we need to match it with mean arterial pressure. And that's the way to maintain our cerebral perfusion pressure. And for traumatic brain injury, if that's what we think is going on, the CPP needs to be about 60 to 70. And if you get it any higher than that, we tend to see respiratory failure with too much fluid. What if we think that this is a hemorrhagic stroke or a spontaneous bleed that caused this guy to fall off his bike? Nobody knows right now. Then the guidelines are a little bit different. Then we know that it should be less than 180, but maybe it should be less than 140. What we're trying to do with that guideline is say, we don't want that spontaneous bleed to increase in volume, to get larger. So we want to bring it down, but we don't want to bring it too far down because we might then compromise our perfusion. So the latest study that we have that's very useful is the ATT&CK2 trial. What they did was prospectively randomize spontaneous bleed patients to less than 180 versus less than 140, thinking if less than 180 is good, more is better. What they found was not necessarily true. They were roughly the same. Now there's some limitations with this study. Most of the patients actually lived in the 140 to 160 range. But the point that we take from this is that less than 180 for sure is where we want to be and maybe less than 140. It's safe for some people, but how do we interpret this? How do we use this? This is what most of us do. We look at the patient and think about who he is. Is he a chronic hypertensive who lives in the 200s? Then he needs perfusion. If he's otherwise healthy and lives in a normal blood pressure range, maybe we can push him down lower. If we don't know, then we're probably best off being conservative. If he's on antihypertensive medications and is very good about it, maybe he can go lower as well. So it all depends. The chronic hypertensive, we want to be conservative and we want to treat him with less than 180. The otherwise healthy person can go maybe to less than 140. If you don't know, probably best to be conservative. And if he's controlled and he lives in a good range, then maybe you go less than 160. It's a conversation and it really takes a history and getting to know who your patient is. And this is always a conversation. But the other thing to take into consideration is he starts off in the 200s. You don't want to ever drop somebody less than or more than 20, 25%. So if we take 200, this guy by these criteria should be targeting around 150. And now let's go back and look at his scan again. We don't really know. Is this TBI? Is this spontaneous bleed plus TBI? What are we targeting? And then there's the question of the belly. So just to review, if it's traumatic brain injury, we want to be greater than 110. We don't want to ever drop below that. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, we want to be probably less than 180, less than 160. But if it's abdominal trauma too, now we're in trouble because those patients want to be at a lower blood pressure so as to not push the bleed. Pretty much of a bind here, aren't we? We want to gently lower that blood pressure and not too much. I'm going to bring out my favorite therapeutic, and that's fentanyl. Everybody with blood in the head has pain. Give them a touch of fentanyl. Give them 50. Or just put an infusion on board. Start low and titrate up. You will see that the blood pressure will come down ever so gently but effectively, and the patient will be more comfortable. But we're getting ready to intubate this guy. How do we intubate safely with somebody whose blood pressure is really very important? The first thing we want to think about is hydration. EMS fortunately started a line, got this guy going. He had almost a liter when I saw him and we started more fluid. If you have time, it would be nice to have an A line, but we didn't. And if you have really have time, you might start an esmolol drip for that fine tuning manipulation of blood pressure. If it happens to go up, you can start the drip and work it up. That's a little bit of an anesthesia trick that I learned from my colleagues. But if the blood pressure goes somewhere you don't want it to go, be ready with your push dose agents. In this case, I was ready with phenylephrine because when we put the laryngoscope in and we use our agents to intubate him, I'm worried that I'm going to drop his blood pressure too much. I'm also ready with agents to bring it back down if it happens to go too high. So back to our guy. 
he ended up having, he, he had a left temporal contusion, bilateral subdural hemorrhage, bilateral subarachnoid hemorrhage, left one, three, four, and five rib fractures, a pulmonary contusion, and a left kidney urinoma. He ended up not having any blood in the abdomen, which was good. He went right to the OR. He had a right hemicraniectomy. They evacuated the subdural hemorrhage and put in a left frontal ICP bolt. He spent 33 days in the hospital, but I really do believe that our management of his blood pressure helped his outcome. So the message here is blood pressure goals are important, but they're also specific to what the patient is suffering through. Try to figure out as best you can what's going on. Know your parameters and know your guidelines and focus on the history before you start doing anything. Thoughtful management is going to help improve the outcome for your patients. Thank you very much. (laughs) 